So I think we're recording. And uh, today's Sutta class is on good friendship. We're finishing the last little paragraph on good friendship. Many of you here are already good friends in one way or the other, at least uh, with this community. And hopefully you have lots of other good friends in your life and you are good friends to each other and the people around you. And since it's the last paragraph, we may well get on to the next chapter called One's Own Good and the Good of Others. And for those who are here for the first time, it's this wonderful book called Social and Communal Harmony, a little compilation from the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. The two bhikkhunis here don't come with the book, but they're very nice little stickers. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a really great start to the suttas for anyone interested in knowing a little bit more about the Buddha's teachings from the, from the Buddha himself. Uh, and it's sorted into little uh, chapters on various themes. So we are now on page 89, at the bottom of page 89. And uh, this is the Buddha talking to monks, but any time that the Buddha does speak to the monastic community, sometimes it's more relevant to people in the robes, but other times it can be applied. Normally it can be applied and be made relevant to all of us, I think. So we'll go through the first one and then we'll probably get into the next chapter. But uh, since I've been quite busy visiting friends and family and just nonstop engagement with people, I would like this not to be teacher centric, but to be a discussion. And I think that's what makes these uh, sort of discussion classes, if you like, so rich is that it's an opportunity to share our own reflections sometimes um, objections, sometimes inquiries, whatever it might be on the Buddha's teachings to make them relevant and to make them something that you can really take away and put into practice. So I'd love to hear everyone's voice, or at least some of you, it might not be possible to get to all of you. Um, you're welcome to write in the chat at any time and I will read out any comment or question from there, but it's even nicer if you're brave enough to unmute you just need to stick up your virtual hand and one of the co-hosts, I think Minori today, will unmute you and give you the cue to speak and your voice will be on the recording, but not your face. It's pinned to my mug. So <laughs> I take that, uh, that uh, slight discomfort for the sake of everybody here. So you can remain anonymous. And uh, let's begin, shall we? Shall we just start? <clears throat> So I'll stop from time to time and invite the questions. So here we go, page 89, and this is called When a Monk or When a Renunciate Has Good Friends. And he's speaking to a person called Meghia. So the Buddha says, Meghia, when liberation of mind has not matured, five things lead to its maturation. What five? Number one, here, Meg here, a monk or a monastic or anyone has good friends, good companions, good comrades. Just synonyms for each other there. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the first thing that leads to its maturation. So this is a, a little bit reminiscent, isn't it, of the Buddha when he says that our spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life. Here it's a little bit different, but he is saying it's the first thing that leads to the maturation of the mind, of liberation, isn't it? So it leads to the mind being so mature that it's liberated. And I think here it means not only in deep samadhi, but also liberated from the defilements of greed, hate and delusion. So once again, that friendship is key and it's the first thing. So if we do have good friends, including good teachers and those who wish they had good teachers or maybe don't have very strong connections to teachers, don't worry because the Buddha is number one among all Kalyanamitas, among all teachers and friends. He's the best friend we could ever have, which is the main reason I wanted to do these sort of discussion groups. You can really rely on the Buddha the Buddha's word as something you can trust and at least give great consideration to. So the second one, again, a monastic or a layperson 
is virtuous. They dwell restrained by the patimoka. So that's the uh, training. Let me think about how I like to say this. Some people call it the, um, the rules of monastic uh, conduct, but I prefer to call it uh, the, the training in restraint, the patimoka. Uh, but it also means it leads to liberation. So for the bhikkhus, they recite and they practice 227 training rules. And the bhikkhunis practice 311. <laughs> so those who use uh, higher amounts of precepts as justification for being more worthy of honor and praise <laughs> can now do the same thing when it comes to bhikkhunis. <laughs> Of course, it doesn't matter, right? It's the way we do it. It's how we apply it. And it's our understanding and wisdom that develops through it that's really most important. So again, what is virtuous? Dwelling restrained by the patimoka. Possessed of good conduct and resort. <clears throat> seeing danger in minute faults. Having undertaken the training rules, one trains in them. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the second thing that leads to its maturation. So here we're talking about the training in virtue, essentially, and the patimoka. I like the word restraint. You could also call it learning to guard the senses. It's a kind of more refined training in virtue that uh, starts to permeate to the mental level too and starts to also look at many, many different ways to, uh, to conduct ourselves, you know, such as ways of being respectful to one another, things like not kind of slurping when you chew your food, being mindful, things that will uh, further refine the mind, basically. And again, even if you're not monastic, this is referring to the Patimoka, but even for someone who's not a monastic, we can certainly uh, refine our virtue, our virtuous conduct. And uh, I've seen already in the chat that the natural question to arise is that why do women have more than men and i would say more that it's uh bikunis having more than bikus and this is pretty arbitrary as far as i'm concerned it's more the case that the uh patimoka the uh training and restraint arose in context in the buddha's day uh according to specific situations that arose so it was always a response to situations that were real and that were happening at the time. And it wasn't meant to be something fixed and rigid and sort of set in stone. It was more a system of general uh, guidelines that we have to apply, as I say, with wisdom and compassion. So um, I don't think it really matters that there were more for the bhikkhunis than for the monks. It could have been the opposite. It could have been that if, you know, the Buddha was still alive and still documenting all these different things, then that could have changed a lot by then. There'd probably be thousands and thousands by then because it's a response to all the silly things people did. And uh, those extra rules for women aren't necessarily more serious ones. It's uh, just very specific to things that happened um, uh, that he felt he needed to address at the time. So I hope that's a good enough explanation for the purpose of the Sutta class. Yeah, great. Excellent. Uh, so that was number two. So I'll, I'll move on because if I say a little about each, I'm sure that will elicit more discussion and questions coming up. So the first one was having good friends. The second one was dwelling restrained by the training rules of the Vinaya in particular for monks and nuns. Number three, again, a renunciate gets to hear at will without trouble or difficulty, talk concerned with the austere life, that means the monastic life or the holy life, that is conducive to opening up the heart. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the third thing that leads to its maturation. <clears throat> I find this very lovely, actually. Uh, very much related to the first, because good friends doesn't only mean buddies to socialize with. In fact, in this context, it certainly means wise friends. 
But obviously the outcome of having wise friends and in a way the purpose of that is so that we can hear the teachings with ease. Yeah, so we get to hear at will without trouble or difficulty. Talk concerned with the austere life that's conducive to opening up the heart. So it's not talk that's kind of... Uh, it incites you to feel guilty or sinful or kind of bad about yourself it's talk that actually leads to inspiring and to you know something you can apply something that makes sense something that seems to inspire I think that's really lovely to opening up the heart maybe being easy to teach yeah and for me, this is also about the access to teachings and the importance of access to teachings, which I take quite seriously in my role. Um, and also as a monastic, uh, one of the things I've always done as a monastic is to try to find teachers who I feel I have a connection to in the sense that I can speak to them about my practice and I can show myself in a way as I am, you know, without fear of being judged or um, rejected um and to just be very sincere and open and uh sometimes it is a matter of a, a sort of uh a fit you know a certain uh communication channel perhaps that makes it easy to have that talk other times it's just uh you know it might not be perfect but you take what you can from the various teachers that are available to you uh many people have many many different teachers that they listen to they might not have met any of them but they listen to various talks at different times and that's also valid so i think this is really lovely that we get to hear at will without trouble or difficulty talk concerned with the austere life strange translation austere but i think it's also in a sense helping us to uh take those training rules further again in a way that's not uh punitive in any sense but that opens the heart so it has to make sense yeah <clears throat> and then the fourth thing again a monastic has aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities one is strong firm in exertion not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities when liberation of the mind has not matured, this is the fourth thing that leads to its maturation. So here we're kind of moving, aren't we, from the sila, from the virtue, into the restraint, the higher virtue, if you like, that starts with a little bit of sense restraint as well, and then into the classic definition, almost classic definition, a summary of what right effort in the Eightfold Noble Path means. So again, this is a kind of sequential uh, exhaustion, what do you call, teaching that, um, that very much runs parallel to the gradual training. So in the gradual training too, we start by hearing the teachings, getting confidence in those teachings, and then, you know, simplifying our lives, practicing virtue, and then sense restraint. And this leads to mindfulness. So it includes that right effort, the forerunner to right mindfulness. And then the number five, when a person, I will say, is wise, they possess the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of craving. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the fifth thing that leads to its maturation. So quite interestingly, we hear jump from the right effort, if you like, or right endeavor, the cultivation of those wholesome qualities to having a wisdom that discerns the arising and passing away of all phenomena, of all phenomena that do arise and pass away, which is all phenomena, <clears throat> which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. So here, obviously, that wisdom ends up as maturation of mind, but it also leads towards it. So I think that's a quite a good teaching to kind of remind us to start reflecting on impermanence and maybe turning our mind toward that in our meditation. Yeah. 
So then he finishes, when Meg here, a monastic has good friends, good companions, good comrades, it can be expected that they will be virtuous. One who dwells restrained by the Patimoka, that they will get to hear at will without trouble or difficulty, talk concerned with the austere life that's conducive to opening up the heart and that one will arouse energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and cultivating wholesome qualities, and that they will be wise, possessing the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. So that's very nice, because if you notice, the last paragraph is not actually just summarizing what we've said before, but it's actually saying that the good friends are the cause of the rest of it, yeah? So the good friendship is uh, the first factor that leads to the maturation of the mind, but also is the cause for all the others to happen. Again, pointing to that inevitability of being conditioned in wise ways and that wisdom, that conditioning leading to the path unfolding in a natural order. So I think that's very inspiring right that when we have the good friends the good companions it will be expected of us that will be virtuous dwell with restraint hear the dhamma arouse the energy and eventually be wise and then suffering so very similar in a way slightly different presentation to the other sutta where the buddha says that if one has wise friends, Kalyanamitta is the whole of the holy life because it will be expected that somebody will practice the Eightfold Path. So many, many times in the suttas, it's very beautiful when we can start to draw these connections and see that these don't contradict themselves. They just explain something very similar in a different way from a different angle. And we can add little bits from here to kind of fill out bits from other parts and uh, just flesh it out and have a much bigger picture. So there we go with this one. And there's a lot in there uh, that we could discuss if you wish. Um, but in particular, if anything is uh, confusing or if you have any questions or comments on any part of that, then please uh, raise your hand. It'd be really nice to hear from you. It can also be things you've noticed in your own practice. Yeah, maybe how you've used some of these, uh, these practices and what you've noticed about their effects on your mind. Mm, please raise your virtual hand if you wish. Not sure if Nikki has something, yeah? I know, I'm so colourful, you can't see where my hand is. I just, um, I, I, um, I really don't understand what you just said. <laughs> Can you, I was trying to, I don't know if it's because I'm tired, but I, I, in terms of practical life, what would that look like? Okay, the whole thing, what would it look like? Oh, that's, no. a bit, that's a big question. <laughs> and it might be that I'm tired too. Um, I mean, this is what we have to start looking at, isn't it, for ourselves, really? Like, what does that look like for you? Because I'm sure that you have a part of this already. Like, what does it look like for you when you have good friends? Like, how does that influence your state of mind? How does that lead to um the mind maturing right and then how when <clears throat> you are practicing virtue does that lead to more restraint you know maybe you realize that i don't know watching a kind of movie that stirs up the emotions or that's kind of disturbing in some way doesn't really help your practice you know it comes back at you when you sit down to meditate for example and then you realize that naturally you know a part of refining your conduct is to like choose better import or choose less import for example um and then obviously as an aspect of having say a good friend to be around a mature person a person that talks about the dhamma a lot you get to hear the dhamma you get to clarify uh uh the teachings as a result of which that inspiration i find helps me to make a determination in a way to cultivate wholesome qualities you know it's almost it's almost instinctive we maybe don't like notice it step by step by step and it might not be linear but all those things start to feed into one another I think and it can be so individual as to how and when exactly it happens 
But once we do start cultivating wholesome qualities, you know, you start to see more meta in your mind. You start to see maybe more equanimity, you know, when things don't go your way. Then a certain wisdom comes to bear, doesn't it? You know, you realize, oh, it doesn't make sense to have anger. It doesn't make sense to get upset when things are changing anyway. You know, uh, we just start to kind of understand more and more and of course all along the way I think if we can have someone to talk to some wise friends to discuss this with it clarifies that process a little bit more so yeah there's a part of us that makes that effort and determination but I think for me these suttas indicate more and more and maybe that's just the way it's been presented to me they kind of are pointing to a process that happens quite naturally as a result of wise company and I think that's the purpose of this particular chapter, you know, just pointing out the importance of that. And you can look at it the opposite way, right? You can look at it in terms of what happens when you're the wrong people or around people that encourage you to do maybe things that aren't so skillful. Then what happens, you know, maybe you start to lose some of those wholesome qualities in your mind, at least for that moment, you know, maybe you're not able to be as wise or as skillful in your dealings with others does that make sense that's yeah, just yeah. preview like like you've concluded it all so it's i can then that was yeah. so you've read it out and then you've concluded and that to me helps me then go oh i see what you're saying <laughs> so that was the <laughs> conclusion of it. it was good thank you um susie you can unmute and talk message to unmute no? she asked me to unmute Minora. oh sorry by mistake so i'll mute myself again and you can unmute uh, susie okay Hi. is it working now yes um so i was wondering about um the relationship between solitude and wise company so I've noticed on myself and in my practice, um, solitude has quite a big um, space in there, but also wise company. So I don't know. I'm just uh, wondering if Vulnerable or anybody else has any reflections about that. Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, it depends how we interpret the Buddha's teachings here because it says when a person has good friends good companions good comrades it doesn't say keeps company it doesn't talk about being in company it talks about having good friends you see the subtle difference there to me it's not necessarily saying we should socialize or we should hang around with people a lot it's more to do with the kind of people we uh, live with maybe the kind of people we listen to the kind of things that we give ear to um, because in the Buddha's teaching generally he emphasizes solitude but he also emphasizes um, being with the right people and that's why he created things like monasteries it's not so you can spend all day talking it's so that you actually can be around people that are also inclined to solitude and that you can discuss the Dhamma with and particularly discuss the practice with, or not only the meditation practice, the whole practice, so that you get much clearer on that. So I think there can be disadvantages to too much company, but also to too much solitude. You know, people like solitude, people who like meditation tend to love solitude, and that's great. But I also think because the path is such a subtle thing, we need to check in with teachers from time to time to make sure our own insights and understandings still line with the Buddhas um, and are still leading in the direction that the Buddha advised them to be. Because otherwise, what I've seen with some practitioners, there can be a lot of overestimation, actually, of their so-called stages on the path. Or there can be a sense that, yes, they're um, progressing on the path, but they might be getting quite selfish in a way and forgetting about the bigger picture forgetting that there are other beings too that maybe it's nice to remember and to serve and you know to make sure that practice is integrated when they speak and when they act towards others so yeah I think uh, 
both are necessary on the path, but really the bottom line here is just having the right input, the right guidance, so that if we do go into solitude, we can make good use of it. Does that make sense? And I think just to add at the end that it's very individual, that some people will benefit from more input, some people less. But I think to have none at all would not be advisable for anybody unless you're already a stream winner, because we're only learning to practice at the moment. Practice means we're practicing to practice properly. We don't actually practice properly until we're stream winners. Yeah. Shirley. Hi, hi. I hope uh, I keep dropping out and freezing. So I hope, uh, I hope, uh, I, well, if I don't stay with you, then it'll be okay. But uh, I hope uh, I don't disappear. But if I disappear, my internet connection seems to be a bit weird. Um, I just wanted to really offer a couple, well, I want, I want to offer a reflection actually from Sue. But first of all, um, I think. I was reflecting how conditioned we are and we're I think we're always we're completely conditioned really and the biggest thing that conditioned us is the company we keep and I think this is why the Buddha um really really emphasis spiritual friendship because I'm different with different people um and uh yeah so I think it's it's it, it's this it's the fact that we are all we can do really because actually I think we have very little choice we think we've got a lot of choice in what we do but we actually have very very little choice and I think if we're with good people then we tend to sort of um, become better people and if we're with bad people then we tend to go down the slippery slope but I also wanted to say something very quickly about solitude because uh, I've just spent uh, five days in a Benedictine monastery in complete, in more or less, almost total silence because I just wanted a silent, solitary retreat. And I was going to book a little cottage just to be on my own. And then I thought, I'm not going to be able to cope. But even though this was a different tradition and I didn't get to speak to the nuns hardly at all. And I went to the services, which were really quite alien to me. Um, I felt the support of their practice. I can't explain why. So this really chimed in what you were saying, Venerable Chanda, about it was the solitude was beautiful, but I don't think I'd have been ready to go into a cottage completely on my own. The, the, the support of being in a holy place was, was amazing. And you don't have to actually verbally communicate at all. Yes, yes. And you don't even have to, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be um, the, 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 the teachings in, in your tradition in a way. I mean, that's important, of course, but on, you know, on a heart level, I felt really supported by the Harrison's practice. It was just so beautiful. And, uh, I just felt inspired to share that with you all uh, you. after what Susie said, because I just felt so blessed having those uh, few days on my own. This place is only just down the road from me. I didn't know it existed because they just don't advertise. <laughs> it's just very lovely. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Because yes. solitude is so beautiful, but I felt I felt this this friendship, even though it was it was quite yeah. austere in a way. Yeah, yeah, lovely. In the silence, thank you, Marianne. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, not very loudly, but we can. Okay, let me try to speak a little louder or come nearer to the computer. Yeah, uh, thank you, really, for. It's really nice to hear you reading and explaining the, the Dhamma. And, it's a bit uh, quiet, Marianne. I wonder if you could come a little closer or really oh, raise your voice. I don't know how. Um, okay. okay. Well, we, I can still hear you. Better now? It's okay. I can still hear okay. you. No, I just uh, said thank you for 
it's my first time to join and uh, I really appreciate uh, the way this uh, the way you read and the way you explain uh, and uh, this particular topic I, I really I felt it on my body actually now because I, I for Christmas I was with my family who uh, doesn't understand anything of <laughs> of Buddhism or uh, vegetarianism or anything and then I went straight to um, a monastery I've just come out from one week retreat with uh, 30 other lay people and but many nuns and very inspiring uh, and uh, the difference is just enormous to be around uh, good companions and good friends they call us friends also which is really nice oh. so uh, so I, I like you can feel it immediately how you get inspired uh, and how you practice better like mm. this morning I meditated like one hour by myself and uh, I was able to join this this zoom because you really get inspiration and you really feel um motivated to 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 practice more and learn more so yeah um, yeah lovely I'm very glad for you that you've had that very obvious contrast and especially plenty of positive input yeah. <laughs> it can really help us so much and it's great when that becomes clear isn't it it's really great yeah I can see that Richard has Richard. his hand up okay. yeah Richard can you unmute Yes, hello. Um, hello, Venable. Um, sort of, um, I found so you know, it's sort of very good practice going to the class. I go to a meditation class, so sort of twice a week from the you know for the meditation in, in West London, uh, you know, to a to a certain vihara in Chiswick, and it's really nice. And the class only lasts about an hour, but I usually go for about you know about two hours, and it's actually really nice because it is actually going to visit, you know, you know, go to visit um, friends of virtue, you know, these are monks. And uh, I go to visit the Bante. And uh, if I have any any questions, I go to visit him. And I ask him for his advice. And it's just nice just to sit there, you know, just to sit there, make some coffee and, you know, just sit around. And, you know, it's just very nice. There's a class that's there. Um, Wednesdays and um, Wednesdays and Saturdays, and um, because the very principle is just simply there, just to you know be in this group, and we don't really do anything other than meditate as a group for about an hour. Yeah. But it's actually being with um, with the right sort of I'm not saying right, you know, politically right, but it's um, just being with the like-minded people in the Dharma. Yeah. And it actually has just actually have an influence on character, you know, and it's just really nice. Mm -hmm. And it sort of balances balances the solitude, you know, if you're so inclined to like the solitude, of course. And it's nice to have a balance, but it's nice to go to a place, you know, associated with the Dharma as well. Just have a just actually help. Yeah. That's yeah. my, you know, that's my um input into it as having right friends thank you yeah, yeah yeah and that kind of consistency of going regularly and yes every yeah, week, yes. yeah and also i think one of the things you touched on there without saying those words was a sense of acceptance and just being able yes, to relax course. you know just being around mm. and not having to be something just you know get your cup of tea and you know that's yes, why we're nice. cre creating our monastery so there were more places that's like well. that so that when we're big enough, people can come and have the same kind of experience. You know, yes, more strange. and more places. I mean, that's the whole yes. purpose, really, of uh, centers, right? Of centers, of monasteries, of retreat centers. They're not. They don't happen through individuals. They happen through groups, and they happen for groups, so that many, many people can have that experience. So, yes, it's first yeah. nice to you know, yeah. to be in your, you know, to come to your class. Okay. So for a connection to the class and to yourself. So yeah. it's a very nice to be in your class and to feel like I'm accepted as well. So, you know, thank you, Gullible.
I also really love it. I mean, I'm around like-minded people too. So yes, of course. Win-win, win-win a situation. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Tamali, can you unmute? Thank you. I just wanted to say a big thank you to Venerable Chanda again, like when you were reading this, um, you know, I um, probably like many others, um, you know, the COVID and the lockdown was really hard and um, kind of the practice went down. And then I only just had to see Venerable overnight. It's just to, you know, that inspiration, the energy and um, Again, just having a place, just, um, you know, having spent a few days um, in Oxford, um, the silent days, um, the teachings, the opportunities, just want to say a big thank you. This paragraph, like, just reminded me of everything, just the joy of being around and how much it's just uplifted and, you know, almost like restarted my practice um, within a very short time period, having like probably not done much at all in the last two, two and a half years. Um, so um, thank you, you know, lots of gratitude and thank you so much, you know. Thank you. Yes, I know, because I like how you say thank you, you know, because I know, because I feel how sincere that is. And I just feel how like enriching it was for me and for the whole community to sort of have people coming through who really benefit, you know, and who contribute so much as well. So you're very generous and receptive to the Dhamma and generous in your service as well. So, yeah, really lovely. I mean, it's the joy of of developing these places for me that it can it's, it's kind of like it's not any one person because it's something that's created through community and through the input of so many, many people, like thousands of people, right? If you think, consider all the donors from people in Sri Lanka who donated a few rupees, you know, to big donors across the other side of the world or, you know, and then all the effort of all the volunteers. It's These places are kind of powerhouses somehow, even if they're fairly new. So, and it's also in the recipient <laughs> is how sensitive you are to that and it won't always be the case for everyone and it won't always be the case for the same people either right it depends it's like a it's like a dynamic between the whole group so yeah so I just want to say it's, it's beautiful when that happens we're co-creating places of practice so thank you for being part of it and uh yeah more discussion Diana Diana, can you unmute? Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm unmuted. Oh. Um, I am noticing quite a bit this line about uh, talk concerned with the austere life, this phrase, the austere life, mm -hmm. and thinking about what that means. To me, austerity means goes along with renunciation or having less things, being content with less, um, or giving things up that are maybe enjoyable or um, pleasant because they take one away from the path, perhaps. So I don't think it's a um, bad word austere but it's an unusual word not used to seeing it in these texts and there is the qualification that it's talk concerned with the austere life that's conducive to opening the heart so that suggests that austerity in other words giving things up or living a simple life or making do with the least amount necessary um, may open the heart or may not open the heart yeah. Some some austerity will be conducive to opening the heart and other might shut one down like, oh, I'm very unhappy because I don't have anything, <laughs> for example. I don't know how to explain it, but I'm thinking about that a lot and I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what that might be, like talk concerned with the austere life that is conducive to opening up the heart. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, that's beautiful because I think you're quite right. It does definitely suggest that there's talk about the austere life that would not open the heart. And, you know, by kind of extension, austerities that don't open the heart. And I guess the thing that sprung to mind was uh, this uh, Atakila Matana yoga, which means like uh, uh, practices that tire and fatigue the body and mind. So in other words, what's often translated as self-mortification, one of the extremes that is not the middle path. So that kind of going to an extreme where you're actually harming yourself uh punishing yourself perhaps is is certainly not um going to conduce to inspiring conversations you know or let's go and see who can stand on one leg for the longest time you know <laughs> and see if we can like i mean even today there are uh, aesthetics in in india who kind of stand with one arm up and the arm just kind of starts to slowly die you know or people who grow their nails so long that it all becomes really rotten and horrible and <laughs> so i think talking about that is not meant to open the heart right because it's our heart doesn't kind of naturally feel yeah that sounds wise <laughs> um but when something is wise it tends to open the heart and i think there are other suttas where it says talk connected with wanting little talk connected to simplicity to contentment to fewness of wishes and I think maybe it's connected to that, you know, uh, and it's just that the word austere is used, but it means not in a kind of woo scary way, but in a way of uh, starting to see the delight and the happiness in renunciation, as you said, you know, in letting things go, in having less, you know, like my friend here, she said today, you know, there's such joy in tidying things up and having a clear living space. Some people don't mind. They don't mind the clothes strewn all over the bed. You know, they don't mind if the dishes are kind of left for a few days, but she finds great delight in clearing it all up and, you know, putting things away and feeling like she can minimize uh, the way the things in her living space. And uh, there's a joy to that if we only care to look. You know, even talking about that, talking about what we can give away, I can see some of you smiling along because it's kind of nice, right? You feel like, ah, free, I'm free. And on the other hand, I mean, for me, starting this monastery is kind of a little bit, um, what's the word, uh, uh, ironic in the sense that on the one hand, I'm starting a monastery and the monastery is a place where people renounce. And yet I'm starting to have to think about things I need at the monastery <laughs> and actually accumulating things like simple things like a, a cupboard in a room or a table. And it's like, oh, I feel the the heaviness of that. You know, I feel like, oh, gosh, then I've got all this furniture. Then if I ever need to move to a bigger place, <laughs> it's going to be like a work. We're going to have to get a delivery van or something like that. So, yeah, it's, it, it's a whole exploration in and of itself, I think. What is enough? What is too much? What is conducive? How much do we really need? Yeah. And I think that's part of what it means by talk that opens the heart talk that you know is connected with living in an austere way so it's again an individual thing but I love how it talks about opening the heart because again that shows it can't be really qualified it's not like well this talk is good this talk's bad it's like what is inspiring to you you know what is supporting you in your practice and and that's a, a very beautiful exploration quite a big exploration I think yeah yeah, thanks. I'm going to come to um, a comment in the box here because we haven't included uh, this person yet. So <clears throat> they're asking, can we conclude that by having noble friends in our practice and restraining our senses or restraint of our senses is conducive for gaining a better understanding of impermanence? I would say certainly. I mean, it's one of the conclusions we can come to here. Uh, it does seem to be sequential, you know, that from having these good friends and companions, it will be expected that all these other things happen, the restraint, the virtue, the understanding of impermanence, certainly. I mean, I don't know about anyone here, but would you have thought about contemplating impermanence to the depth that maybe some of us have done? or through some of the methods that we've used perhaps without having been taught. I mean, I know for me, because that was my main practice for a long time, I couldn't have possibly come to that subtlety of understanding impermanence and especially the disappearing of phenomena without certain methods that were taught to me. 
um, and without practicing them repeatedly, nor without the sila, nor without the restraint and the virtue. You know, I couldn't have come to that. And I'm sure there's a lot further I can go. Um, and that's why, for me, noble friends in particular give us great insights. And sometimes, you know, it, it's not necessary that a person's noble, but sometimes it can happen more often with a person who is embodying the teachings, embodying the Dhamma, that we just get a kind of kind of aha moment. <laughs> you know, they may say something or they may relate to you in a certain way or just a sense of equanimity they may have, and you just get a kind of shift. A shift can suddenly happen. Again, we're not looking for this, so don't crave it if you don't have that. <laughs> but um I have experienced that, you know, and uh you know, we were saying that we are different people in the company of different people. We can change. But at a deeper level, I mean, sometimes when I've been in the company of people who are very, very deeply connected to the arising and passing away of phenomena, I start to experience it too. You know, it's energetic. You you pick it up. There's a certain subtlety of, uh, you could say, vibration or energy or Mm, how do you say it's almost like an intuitive wisdom that comes across and that you can that can almost be transmitted you can sense that and it, and it's more likely that that may start to arise for you does that make sense yeah so can we come to grace Hi, uh, that's actually exactly what I've been thinking about and what I was going to ask earlier about energy and, and Kalyanamitta spiritual friends and um, I guess uh, the sort of danger, for lack of better words, of being too open and opening yourself up through the practice, being very sensitive to energy and then um, being, you know, not being able to totally seclude yourself and being around others and kind of this, you know, having maybe some negative energy inside of yourself and, and having not being able to um, not being aware of a boundary to close sort of like fill yourself with metta to not allow that to happen um, in a sense and curious um, how to yeah how to work toward preventing that from happening I guess from being too open how to practice toward that yeah, it's interesting that along with that question, you did talk about, I think, the metta uh, and perhaps the equanimity. I mean, they're two things that jump to mind as kind of as practices that can actually act as boundaries uh, in a sense, because sometimes we can't afford, so we can't avoid certain energies. And I think there's a danger in starting to kind of label, oh, this is negative energy or good energy, or, you know, I don't need negative energy because it's like, well, Versus. no one's doing that intentionally. Maybe someone's suffering or whatever, and it's not a bad thing to be touched, right? But mm -hmm. it's also like we can't take so much on that we start to go under. So I think a certain amount of equanimity there is really, really helpful to be able to. Um, understand that yes this is the person's experience and maybe I'm picking up on that and if the sensations in me are unpleasant can I just develop can I just stay with that in, in with equanimity um one of the things that helps me with the equanimity is sensing as it's happening that it's impermanent so mm -hmm. sensing you know the frustration arising or maybe it can be sometimes related to things like not eating enough you're hungry your blood sugar drops or something and mm -hmm. it's unpleasant and you can feel this sort of irritation arise and then you realize oh yeah this is caused <laughs> by something it's nothing personal and it's passing it's changing and <laughs> mm -hmm. um the same thing with you know energy from others as well so sometimes that allows us to stay in a situation with, that we can't avoid with more equipoise um but if we can avoid it I think it's okay I mean give, depending on the situation I mean obviously if it's something that can be very ongoing and almost abusive or something that's like you recognize as association not with the wise you know association with the fool then we might have to make certain changes in our lives to avoid that without condemning the person but just to know that this isn't really conducive company for me right now to develop on the path and for the sake of my own good and being of use and of service in the world, I might have to change my, the people I associate with. Um, so that's on the equanimity side. But the metta as well, I've noticed, 
not only can act as a, a sort of uh, a boundary in a sense that we're less impacted, it, we're less likely to lose our sense of well-being. It can also really have an impact on the people around us so that rather than being too affected by the negative, they get affected by our positive, you know. Mm. Um, so we become more of a, a strong influence for others than they are for us. And I think that's, you know, what's necessary if you're in any kind of teaching role. Of course, you can't always do it. Um, but the teachers who are really strong can always do it. And it's just incredible, you know. I mean, it's not like they will invite difficult people right into their living space, but they will still have a positive impact on almost everyone they come into contact with without getting too off center, if you like. Um, and that's really extraordinary and really inspiring. And I think for people that are around people a lot of the time, it's important to develop a lot of meta um also in community you know living in community for any length of time it's important that everybody should practice meta daily and um in our monastery and in my practice generally i always do meta practice at the end of a sit often my whole sit is meta but always at the end at least five ten minutes meta before we end the sit and that really starts to help and actually change the so-called energy of of the group so that's a couple of ideas Thank you. Say that we should stay in any very unwholesome situation for any length of time if we can avoid doing so. Oh, I think you got quiet a little bit. Yeah, I do get quiet sometimes. I said it's just not meant to, you know, I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't move out of situations that are harmful for us if we're in them for a long period and if we have a choice. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Darren. Can we come to Darren? Hi, Darren. Hi. Um, so good being here. And thank you. Yeah, thank you for everything. And also thank you to everyone for yeah, sharing. Um, I've, re I've really loved listening to everybody and just reflecting on um, what is a good person. Um, and it's the, the wise words, the good actions, how they help, they give. Um, as opposed to, I was just thinking, well, what's the opposite of that? And I wouldn't want to spend time with um, criminals um, because they're going to think and act in a very different way and they're going to harm people. Whereas if I'm with people that are um, kind and wise words, then it's just listening to that and almost by um, osmosis that I know that I'm going to be, that I'll continue to improve um, and, and spread positive energy around the world um, as opposed to negative and there's enough negativity because you, you just have to open up any social media browser and that seems to suck the, the negative energy whereas just associating with positive and just knowing that if I'm associating with those people um, and learning virtuous things then that's just going to I think have an effect on everybody that I come into contact with um, and how I act with them. Yesterday, I was at my daughter's um, taekwondo um, class, and there was a spider in the room. And a lot of people was going, kill it, kill it, kill it. I said, no, 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 why? why? Um, let's just save it, and we'll put it outside. And we did that. And I think it's just those little things that we're sowing these seeds of um, meta com um, compassion, um, kindfulness. Um, and I think if we if we're all doing that, we're all I think naturally, hopefully, paying it forward. Um, so I think it's just it's just the foundation of um, all goodness, really. And I really love it. Thank you. Thank you. That's so beautifully said. Yeah, and I think it's such a motivation when we realise that looking after ourselves and being around company that brings out the best in us is a service to others. Yeah, that's a beautiful. Uh, insight to have and just two things I've picked up as well the word osmosis I, I mentioned transmission I prefer osmosis I was looking for that word actually and I think that's uh that's really lovely because it is it's something that's quite uh subconscious almost but it happens you know it's we're permeable we're we're impressionable and then the other thing about social media because sometimes we forget that things like social media, newspapers, they're also our companions for the time we're engaged. And um, 
you know, we can have great companions around us, but if we're then reading all this stuff about other people that are not such great companions, we're picking up their energy too. I mean, I know for myself, when I read about people who I consider, you know, to have sociopathic behavior, who are maybe in political power, it's kind of, you know, it rouses a lot of unpleasant emotions and feelings in me um, because it's like I'm I'm sort of getting to know them, getting to know their mind. And, yeah, you can feel compassion, but how much do you want to kind of associate with that? Um, so I think we have to be very careful there, you know, because that also conditions us a, a certain way. And especially if we're reading about the horrible things people do to one another. And, you know, it can really give us a very warped perception of the world that it's full of evil and terrible things which is you know the sum of that but in your daily life what do you experience most often mm -hmm. it's probably not that malevolence you know but it's rather people who want to help and I think also with the AI that's built into social media it becomes an echo chamber so the more I sort of, I'm liking um things that are monastic, things that are virtuous. That's what comes into my feed um, and things that I'm viewing, um, which is good because I think, so there are positive things as well, but oh. it's also an action as well. But I think we we go into whichever echo chamber that we, um, yeah, we're unconsciously going into or consciously going into. Yeah, yeah that's right. I'm getting more ads now because I'm looking for stuff for the monastery. <laughs> okay did bill have something too i'm just aware that you've not spoken yet but we'll come to okay we'll go to susie again and um, bill can yes, decide susie can um, yeah i just actually i just have a quick question for you venerable um because we keep on talking like for us lay people we have a choice um of who we essentially associate with more or less i guess um but then it kind of occurred to me that you don't really have that much choice, actually. <laughs> so I was just really wondering how you deal with this same question. Um, yeah, thank you. I like your very cut to the <laughs> heart of it questions because you're really right, actually. And it's one of the things that only sort of really occurs to me in my role now. Um, as a monastic in the beginning, I had maybe less choice too but uh it wasn't an issue because I have my teacher and I didn't really have to associate overly much with anyone else um there were other people practicing with me but they were our central reference point was the teacher uh and in a sense the teacher although I didn't realize I guess I did realize it at the time but they they act like a protective force field at least he did so none of the other difficulty would really touch me I'm sure that he was taking a lot of that on himself and now I'm in the role I am. I indeed do have to associate with many, many types of people. And, um, you know, it's not always going to be easy because some people are quite troubled or they come for different reasons or, you know, they maybe come to stay and maybe they're perfectly wonderful, but I'm tired, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it can be tricky. And part of me feels that's uh, a necessary step in the path to have less choice so that we can put ourselves in situations that may be challenging and that maybe trigger things that we haven't seen that's very important and it's part of the challenge but also potential for growth that community can offer but again it has to be only enough of a challenge that we can actually work with it skillfully and if it is too much and if a person's behavior starts to become harmful I think it's important to know where to draw the line and for me, that's hard because I always tend to say, I can take a bit more, I can take a bit more. You know, I want to help more, even though it's harming me, even though it might not be very helpful for them, but it could be, you know. And so I tend to stretch that a little. And that's my learning curve to know kind of how to protect myself sufficiently so I still have enough to offer to a wider group of people. Because it's not about, you know, always being able to deal, say, I mean, say somebody comes and they really need a lot of attention and their difficulties are, are beyond the scope of my role. Maybe they could do more with psychological help or, I don't know, be in a bigger community or do more meditation retreats, whatever it might be. Um, then that might not be the best use of my time and, my, and myself as a resource, if you like. So then it's the compassionate thing to both parties to say, OK, I can't help anymore um, so that I have more energy available for more people so it's very much a balancing act and it's a big subject uh 
uh, I guess one of the guidelines I'm trying to keep in mind is like protect myself in order to serve for longer and more effectively and to a bigger group of people because that's really my role so yeah personal feelings can't come into it that much sometimes people misunderstand that and think it's aversion to someone it isn't it's just like where can I be of most benefit and equally you know if I particularly get along with somebody I can't say well I'll give them more time because I like the connection and you know it's a very it's a balancing thing and it's I guess natural that there'll be people you can you feel that the the relationship can be of most benefit to more parties and there are others where it might not so yeah it's uh it's it's a big learning curve for me yeah <laughs> thank you so, have you any follow-up on that though before we move on because that's just a big question I don't know if that really gave anything helpful is that okay <laughs> I don't know if you can unmute anyone no I just I just like to express my um admiration for that because I think that's very difficult to do like yeah Thank you. I think so. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's quite validating. Sometimes it's uh, a little daunting. Yeah, but, um, I think it's also for us, like for the people supporting you as a monastic, I guess it's also a good thing to um, be aware of. Like you're not this infinite source of energy for everyone. <laughs> thank you, Cindy. That's very kind. <laughs> That's a very kind thing to say. I appreciate that. <laughs> Bill, do you have a question before we unmute Sean? Uh, all right, I, I, all right. I, I do. I have a question. Though. I mean, part of the, when you talk about the renunciant life, I mean, part of that is the physical piece, which, as a married individual with kids my physical interactions hugging my boys you know hugging my wife you know the, the the just whatever and then even within my my friends um i don't know how do you deal with that i mean because because it, it's see you know i i get the, the the celibacy piece and that stuff but i know like when i went to see bonte uh, sudasso like I was so excited to see him, I wanted to give him a hug, and I was kind of my buddy was like, "No, no, you don't, you don't hug the, you know, you don't hug the mugs." And I was like, oh, "Okay, you know." And so I, I, I guess I, I'm that must be very difficult. Right. Where it's, I guess it's a training thing. I don't. When I hear the renunciant, I not only think of physical possessions, mm -hmm. but I also think of sensory possessions because the Buddha talks about that a lot about. You know, and you and I have talked about music. You know, you used to be a big Zeppelin fan, and you know, you yes. turned off music. Yes, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm a massive music fan. So, I, and I've been practicing trying to listen to a little less. So, I guess that's. I, I'm curious yeah. about that. Okay. In, in yeah. Life and, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think different monastics hold it differently. Obviously, between genders, it's pretty much not. A possibility um and that's not just because we think everybody's heterosexual i mean i almost think it's redundant because we're not right i mean um you know it's kind of in this i don't know i sometimes struggle with that a little bit but what i do know is like most yeah i mean the purpose of that is as much for the individual monastic as it is for the um for increasing the faith of the lay people for not decreasing the faith of the lay people or giving any cause for suspicion so that's the main reason we don't have that physical contact but generally speaking i think i mean in public i would refrain but i don't mind hugging women from time to time i hug other nuns um people who i think are my friends or just who i feel like you know i want to give them a hug so i'm it depends on the people. One of the non, my non friends said, oh, you know, some nuns are huggers, some are not. <laughs> I can't speak for monks. I think it's the same. I think less are huggers. <laughs> That's my sense. Maybe because they've been more in that, um, you know, there's more of a history 
for monks in monasticism than there is for nuns. But I think some bhikkhunis, you know, we kind of feel like we're, uh, we don't have so much kind of cultural uh, tie in a sense. Um, for monks, fully ordained monks, they're usually either from the Thai tradition, the Burmese tradition, Sri Lankan tradition, et cetera, in Theravada. Whereas we're not actually, we're, we don't have that lineage really. We're m more from the Buddha's tradition. So we go back to the early Buddhism and there's nothing in there that says we can't hog uh, someone, at least same gender. Um, so I think it's again, case by case to use your discernment. I'm not gonna kind of go over the top. I'm not gonna be in public necessarily. Um, but for me, the longer I'm in the robes and the more I'm familiar with myself, my mind, the way it works, the more at ease I am around all those things. I don't have to kind of feel like, oh, what do I do now? Like, do I, is it bad? Is it, you know? And it's also not coming from craving. Um, there have been a couple of times, probably, I'm trying to think when, when I've had a male friend who is dear and I think of as a brother and they might be going through some real difficulty and you just think, wouldn't it, isn't it a shame I can't just kind of, you know, just tap them on the back or give them a little hug. That has happened, especially when a close friend who I consider like a father lost his wife, who was very close to me. She, I mean, the two of them are like my parents in a way, like their supporters but you know they're very close and and it was really hard you know because he was kind of trembling and at one point looked like he might faint and I think I, I managed to just hold his hand you know and give it a squeeze and I just felt like it's completely appropriate I mean nobody's going to misinterpret that um yeah so I have seen also men grab Ajahn Brahm and give them a big hug sometimes even a woman will do it who doesn't know what she's meant to not do <laughs> I've seen that a couple of times and he'll be just like he'll just sort of stand there and say I'm oh, very good <laughs> but not engage you know so yeah we're not going to turn into kind of pumpkins or anything we're not gonna yeah personally uh, I don't completely renounce a little hog with a female <laughs> okay can I go to Sean Sean can you unmute Hello, yeah, good evening, and thank you. Uh, 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 as some other people said, uh, to Emerald Chanda for everything and everyone else here for sharing. I find it really helpful. Um, and and going really sort of in, in what we're going through today is evident in, in terms of the text and the sutras in what's happening here um so yes yeah, thank you to everyone i've just really got a couple of comments that just sort of came about from other people's uh what other people said so about social media i thought that was quite interesting because again i would see that as some from my at least personal experience renunciation so i used to be on a lot of social media platforms and i'm not on many at all anymore and I found that difficult to start with, but then once I started it, and I didn't necessarily, it happened sort of with time, it was and accelerated, but I know just, it was, I noticed a massive improvement in my happiness. And it's, it's quite subtle to start with, um, but then as you get that more space, it becomes more evident. And then I think it extends further. So, you know, you listen to the news, it's all negative. My job, uh, I'm a financial advisor, people talk about investments. Oh, you know, it wasn't at the moment. And they just listen to certain bits of news. And obviously fear is a, a bigger emotion than greed, or if for want of better words. But I therefore notice that there is, a lot of negativity that people focus on very easy to get drawn into that and when you're in the right company <coughs> along with the uh renunciation i don't know if you've dropped out sean can other people hear sean no oh that's a shame if you do come back sean you might have to write it in the box so he's talking about the negativity from social media, but he's frozen in time, not hopefully because of the central heating. 
<laughs> or lack of. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm aware he may or may not come back soon, but I'm aware that it's almost time to end the uh, Sutta discussion. Um, before I do, just one more comment from Joel there that he's learned that Thai forest monks massage each other's feet, which is true. Ajahn Ram also gets foot massages regularly from his monks. Lucky thing. I don't have other nuns to do that for me, but uh, I think lay people are allowed to, of the same gender are allowed to give massage, although it very rarely happens. And also bikinis can massage other bikinis. So anyway, it doesn't really happen often, <laughs> but there are those kind of allowances there. Yeah. So but uh bikinis aren't allowed to massage lay people <laughs> and i'm pretty sure monks don't do that either but uh yeah it's true they do massage each other's feet and uh in the buddhist text also it talks about people washing the buddha's feet or giving him water to wash his own at the very least so there are these little ways we can show our care and uh but generally i guess i didn't answer that question too well the general feeling i've had since ordaining is that the happiness starts to come more and more from within not really from those external uh, displays of affection or from that physical contact as much. It becomes less necessary, I think. Um, I mean, I feel so completely loved in such an incredibly unconditional way by my teacher who I've never had, you know, the slightest physical contact with. And that's really remarkable to me that, you know, love goes, real love goes much, much deeper and it doesn't need to express itself that way. So, um, yeah, maybe that's a little bit to add on to that. Um, yeah, so may we all just show our love and kindness and care through wisely associating with each other and valuing each other and, you know, looking at one another with kindly eyes. I think the other thing about this spiritual friendship and being around the wise is that they tend to see our best. They tend to look at us with a lot of generosity and uh, see our potential. And in that, that can bring it out of us as well. That can help us to see it within ourselves. So thank you all for being good spiritual friends. And I think I will hand over to uh, Shell to do a little uh, reflection, Donna, Donna blurb at the end. Um, thank you for all your comments. And uh, yeah, Shell, if you want to say a few words. Uh, Is she there? Thank yeah. you, Venerable. And um, thank you to everyone as well for all your contributions. It's been lovely to listen to it all and reflect on it all this evening. Um, so I'm just going to speak a little bit about how we can support Venerable Chanda. So uh, Venerable Chanda and the Anakampa Bikuni Project offers these sessions in the spirit of dana. So they're freely given to us all so that we've got access to the Buddhist teachings. So we can offer dana in return to Venerable Chanda and the project in a lot of different ways at the moment. So I'm just going to speak through a few of these. So we're particularly supporting Venerable in her day to day life, as well as setting up the Vihara. So you can offer dana in the form of meals. Um, we're also getting together a once week shopping order list, um, which you can support by uh, fulfilling that order for us. Um, also, you can order hot meals to be delivered if you're further afield um, and also ordering things like veg boxes or donating gift cards. We've also got a list of things that are needed for the Vihara and I'll copy into the chat uh, some links in a moment. Um, so you can also join the Anacampa Food at the Ready WhatsApp group, which is supporting Venerable and fulfilling the gaps for all the food dana as well. So to uh, offer any of this dana, please drop an email to team at anacamperproject.org and I'll copy that in a moment into the chat. Um, and if you have time to offer as well, you can volunteer with us, whether that uh, be supporting with admin, co-hosting the calls, or even volunteering to support our Venerable Chanda in person at uh, the Vihara as she has a lot of um, monastic rules that she has to follow. So she does need people there to support her day to day to um, prepare her food and offer her food, as well as the smooth running of the house itself. Um, you're also able to donate uh, monetarily to the project as well um, via the website. But we're also asking people, if possible, to support more regularly through a standing order. Um, and that can be whatever amount. Uh, the amount of a coffee or whatever you can afford 
uh, each month, it really does help with the smooth running of uh, the Vihara. So I'm just going to uh, send through the links in the chat. Um, and if I've missed anything off, Venerable, feel free to fill in the gaps. Okay. Yeah, just two little things. Thank you so much, Shell. I think it's so lovely how you do these little books. And uh, I think you've covered almost everything. There's just one more thing that we're trying to kind of consolidate, which is two groups, WhatsApp groups. One is called AHA <laughs> and one is called AFAR. And uh, it stands for Anukampa Food at the Ready, AFAR, and Anukampa Hands at the Ready, AHA. OK, <laughs> basically, they are like backup groups like Afar, a food at the ready um, is there in case I don't have food that day or in case we need a shopping delivery or in case we need a hot meal. And then we can send a message to the WhatsApp group and those who wish can respond and say, OK, I can do a shopping delivery or I can send a meal uh, or whatever. And then the AHA group, which is even better. <laughs> is uh, Anukampa Hands at the Ready. That's a volunteer group. So that's in case uh, I need a little thing to do, like say I want, okay, someone to transcribe something or someone to come and look at the garden or I need something for the property or something, I could send it to the AHA group, <laughs> Hands at the Ready, Anukampa Hands at the Ready, and uh, anyone can respond. So that's a way of us not having to approach individuals directly and also of you keeping in touch with what may be needed, giving you opportunities to contribute in different ways. For that also, you can write to TMAP, but please write Attention Alley. Uh, I'll just put it in. Okay, I'll just put TMAP, but you know, oops, I've put it twice. So Alley at team at anucumperproject.org. Okay because she'll deal with that. She'll basically add you to the WhatsApp groups. Is that okay? I haven't had time to write in the full meaning of those acronyms, but hopefully you got the point. Uh, yeah, yeah, subject line attention alley, exactly. So I think that's it. And yeah, we will try and get um, shopping once a week. We have vegetable boxes already, but as there are more guests, um, it's very helpful so that they can prepare meals for the Sangha. It won't just be for me. It's not all about me. It's about Sangha. Sangha means monastic Sangha. That's the word Sangha, the way the Buddha used it. He used the word uh, community or assembly for the fourfold assembly. Uh, so when I personally refer to Sangha, I mean monastics, and there'll be two bhikkhunis from February, around mid-February, So, and our guests. So thank you so much, as always, for your amazing support. And uh, we've only done this through the support of, like I say, thousands of people. It's it's really amazing. And um, I really particularly appreciate people who come to the regular teachings because that's the, the kind of heart of all of this. So thank you for a lovely discussion and for all your wise input. It's been really enjoyable for me as well. So take care and uh, we can stop the recording.